Welcome to Made in Mari, the podcast that focuses on the successes and struggles of local businesses. Let's get started. My name is Chi. I'm your host, and today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Sam Dowdall, who is the owner of Speyside Management. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How are you this morning? I'm good, thank you. Sun shining. Oh, it's We're a, looking out over the beach. What could be better? It's an absolutely beautiful day. I'm, I'm kind of semi-jealous of the surfers that are out there. Yeah, and the runners that I've just watched running across the beach all day. Ah, uh, yeah. You can only do that at low tide, though. Well, unless you want a bit of a challenge, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, life is about challenges, Absolutely. Right? There we go. Tell us a little bit about Speyside Management. Speyside Management started in November of last year when I left my role as director of retail within garden centres. Started off as one thing has grown into another and is no doubt going to take lots of turns over the next even couple of weeks and months. Well, that's pretty interesting because life is not a straight road. So what was the vision at the beginning and how did that change? The vision was that I wanted to spend more time at home and didn't want to travel anymore as I'd spent a few years traveling around to different countries buying and and going to different meetings and just wanted to take some time for myself but also needed to work alongside that. So virtual business um, services sprang into my head and this is what I can do and this is what I can offer. Did some research online, looked at what different people were offering and thought, great, that's what I'll do. I, it's quickly become apparent that that's not what it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of people have a vision at the beginning that then transforms into something else as we get more information, as we meet people. So what is it transforming into? What are the areas of your work that are important right now? People are important to me, um, whether that is in business, individuals. I love a challenge. I like unraveling problems and I like to try to solve them. So um, being a virtual assistant Mm -hmm. clearly isn't a good move for me because I'm not seeing people, I'm not interacting with people Mm -hmm. face to face. And and that's where I'm quickly finding that I'm missing that. Yeah, it's not the same when you connect through the digital environment. Although the technology is here for us, we still need to be in the same physical space as people. Yeah, for sure. And and going out, you know, being sat in an office um, in front of a computer screen and working away, you know, that, that has its place. But going and speaking to somebody face to face, I think you can get more of um, just by speaking to people is just to find out what their pain points are, where they're finding it difficult in their business, where I can help and what the problems are that you can solve. Because we all know that putting things in an email or be even speaking on the telephone, there's a lot of things that can be hidden. And I think body language plays a big part in that. So face to face is very important. Absolutely. I took a little look in my research at your website to find out what some of the core elements are in the work that you do to help other businesses. Maybe you can tell me a little bit more about those. Every business needs a plan, um, whether that's um, your marketing strategy, whether it's your business plan, how you're going to do things, how you're going to do things into the future and how you're going to do them day to day. So through speaking to people, and, and this is where I come from, from the face to face, Um, Speaking to people, business owners, people that are, you know, the decision makers within businesses, you can quickly pick up the pain points that people have. And that's where I like to help. So even though those six elements that are on my website kind of railroad people into thinking about what services they could use me for, it is just really that's there to spark some kind of a thought process of where where I can help um, and to open a conversation, really. I like it because it's 
something like a menu where mm-hmm. you can look at it and you can say, I like this, I don't like that. And at the beginning, it's difficult to know where to start, but you have to give people something to hold on to. And I think it does that because planning is one element that's that's important. Uh, we have marketing strategies because in our pre-interview discussion, we talked a little bit about how people maybe know how to create or produce, but they don't know how to sell what it is that they're doing. Yeah, that's it. And absolutely within your business. And if you're um, a sole trader or there's just sort of one or two of you running a business, you're going to have set up that business because you had a passion, um, particularly with creative people. They have a passion for developing something or for making, creating something. So, you know, that business administration or even marketing strategies or their um, being able to go out to market and, and be able to direct people back to their actual product through those strategies, it might not be their bag. And mm-hmm. so that's mine. And, and that's where I like to go in and help because I can see that there's real potential in a business, but it's stopped. This kind of goes back to, I've been working in businesses for 30 years from grassroots from administration assistant for a PR company for Rolls-Royce right up to a retail director and the common theme throughout has always been that dots are never really quite joined Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you've got the tools to be able to pull out of your toolbox your business toolbox um, at any one time you know, you're heading on the road for success, but you're not always equipped to do that. So outsourcing some of that work and bringing in help, it's not a bad thing. It can only be good for your business. Yeah. And eyes from the outside will give you a different perspective on what is happening. Yeah. When you're in the business, you sort of know what it is that that you're doing or you know what it is that you're building. But I think sometimes we don't have the vision of how the consumer or the end client will see the product. Yeah. And so bringing somebody in helps us get a fresh perspective on that. Other elements that I found interesting, project management, business administration, workshops, audits. How do these elements play into how a business needs to be organized? It's all really, it's about the customer journey. My area is retail and heritage and visitor management and again going right back I am a people person and so following the customer's journey right from before they make the decision to either visit you or to buy from you through to when they get back home and they've reflected on their day or they're looking at the purchase that they've made that whole journey is very important to me and very important to business so When I develop those six steps of my business, it follows the whole thing through. So your business plan is planning your business. Marketing is about how you're speaking to your customer, how you're attracting them, um, what after sales you're going to give them, how they're going to get the word out about your business for you. The project management was all about getting those projects going and following through with projects, making sure that your business I had different projects that it could fulfill. Administration pretty much speaks for itself in that, mm-hmm. you know, you, you any part of the business needs administering. And I think people forget about this because if you're trying to do everything yourself, which is a mistake a lot of people make, you get caught up in doing a lot of admin, it takes time and you then you don't have time to focus on the other elements that are important. Absolutely. And what you're good at, you know, if your if your passion is not business management and your passion is your product, why put your product on the back burner while you deal with the boring stuff? Yeah, you you gotta be able to transmit your passion to other mm-hmm. people yeah. as well. And you can't do that or at least it's very difficult when you're in a closed back room somewhere you've got to be out meeting people networking going to events showcasing what it is that you've got something that interests me why focusing on the retail heritage and tourism why is that important people and service 
All right. Do you think that's specifically related in some way to this area or this part of the world that we're in? No, people and service um, worldwide. Um, why Scotland and, and why here? Why focus around here? There's such a massive opportunity in Scotland, particularly with tourism and heritage, to engage with people, to engage with tourists, to engage with customers, to to engage with anybody really that passes our door. So there's a lot of businesses, and, and quite rightly, that are people facing, but relatively smaller businesses, I think, in Murray. And to really to get that to blossom, to get that to bloom, there's, there's a lot of other people that can they can bring in to help them to, to get that message out. I think if I can paraphrase that, it's that you can't build it all yourself. No. And people want to, it's natural to be able to want to do that, but you need to build a team. That's why business meetup groups, for example, yeah. are important. Yeah. People share ideas, they can bounce information off other people, they can get constructive <laughs> feedback <laughs> rather than people just saying, no, no. You know, people can actually yeah. tell you where an idea might work yeah. or, or give you another perspective on it. I'm really curious about your origin story. If we go back before you came here to this region because you're not from this region originally no i'm from the midlands right so how did you get here what was what was that journey oh um so as i said before i started my career journey was um from grassroots i left school and between leaving school and going to college to do my a levels um i took a job which would see me over the summer um, money was a great motivator then. Um, it was as a receptionist for a PR company. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that that's where I was going to stay and didn't bother with college. Right. So worked my way through, worked for lots of different companies in different roles until I found my absolute passion for heritage and heritage mm -hmm. management. And so I worked for Coventry City Council and I was a visitor services manager uh, for Coombe Abbey Country Park, which was a historic park, capability brown landscape. Wow. And um, I had the best boss in the world. He pushed me to the absolute limit. We were at loggerheads most of the time, but that was because I was stubborn and he was as stubborn, but wanted to push me as far as he could to make me do something with my passion. Mm -hmm. So um, at the age of 32, I mm -hmm. took my master, I started a master's degree. And previous to that, I'd already done my business management degree. Mm -hmm. So he pushed me on to do this. And um, yeah, that took five years of distance learning to, wow. um, to crack that nut. And after having spent all of the, that time studying and um, there was really nowhere for me to go within the park service and uh, so I left and I went off to Winterbourne Gardens in Birmingham okay wow but was made redundant <laughs> <laughs> you know sometimes what is apparently negative is a blessing in disguise absolutely yeah yeah. So when I was made redundant, it was all, you know, the world's going to crumble in and what do we do now? But we'd been visiting this beautiful part of Scotland for 10 years previous to that. Every Christmas, New Year, Easter, we would come up here as a small family um, and this is where we would spend our holidays. And how did you discover this region? We stuck a pin in a map <laughs> and so we really one Christmas we had decided that we were absolutely fed up with our families fighting over us where we would go on Christmas Day. Right. And all we wanted for our daughter was for her to remember Christmas as the experience of being together with us and being off her school and just having a lovely time mm. instead of being dragged around from one parent to another being showered with Christmas presents, 
which is not a bad thing, but it, it, it can't always be a good thing. Um, and remember Christmas for being Christmas and, and the times that she had rather than the things that she had. Mm-hmm. So we decided that we would go on holiday, right? which we booked a holiday. It was to Gran Canaria. Mm. And uh, we thought, how lovely, spending Christmas on the beach, yep. <laughs> nice and warm, and no no family as such. Then we got a puppy. Oh, wow. Um, and decided that we couldn't leave the puppy mm. while we were away over Christmas. So yeah. we cancelled our holiday and decided that we would stay somewhere in the UK so that we could take the puppy with us. Mm. Um, and so we took a map and a pin wow. and... Um, closed our eyes and and stuck a pin in a map and this is exactly where we were um, destined to go and my first reaction was I'm not going to Scotland it's dirty (laughs) (laughs) well it's it's cold and it's wet yeah and there's men who wear skirts and and um, in my head Scottish people were not nice people, what? and um, where, where, where and did you I get was that and, and I from? so this is you know I'd never been north of Manchester, so <laughs> um, <laughs> so this was a big shock to me, um, but it was an agreement an agreement that we'd made, and so we were going to do it. Wow. So life is full of challenges, and I like challenge. So okay, let's go. Well, because it would have been really easy to just. Close your eyes again. And stick the pin. <laughs> stick the pin somewhere else. <laughs> but right? no, that was the agreement that we had. So uh, the next day, started looking for places to stay um, mm-hmm. that were available over Christmas and New Year, and we found a beautiful cottage, um, just um, near Fordyce, opposite Sandend. So um, it looked perfect. Um, just a week before Christmas, when the schools broke up, everything got packed into the car, mm-hmm. and off off we came for our first Christmas in Scotland. And, and um, all your friends thought you were completely insane. Yeah, I, it it was pretty insane. We we started our journey knowing that it was going to take us about eight or nine hours, and we decided to start off during the evening so that we could arrive the next morning. Thought it would be easier with a seven year old at the time to travel through the night. Okay. And um, we got to our first services stop, decided to have a sleep and woke up five hours later with ice on the inside of the windscreen. Oh. And not, not knowing whether we were still alive or dead. Because <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't, couldn't see anything. Absolutely. So, um, right. so our first journey to Scotland actually took us about 15 hours. Oh wow! Um, but once we'd got here and the snow had started, um, we realised quickly realised that we'd made the right decision, mm. and we've never looked back. We we came every single year. We came back at Easter, mm-hmm. and we've spent uh, we spent summer holidays here, um, and absolutely loved it. So we decided that that's where we were going to stay. Um, mm. And that this is where we would like to move to once my daughter had left school. And then you move on, don't you? And then, you you know, there's always another excuse. Yep. So my daughter finished school, went to high school, and then the bottom fell out of the housing market. Mm. And then there was another excuse and another. Mm. So um, it came to the time when I was working for Birmingham University at Winterbourne Gardens and they were making me redundant and it was going to be quick. So that was the opportunity and no more excuses. We were just going to do it. And that's what we did within about three months. Wow. And you know, how do you rate the decision? Was it a good decision? It was the best decision ever. We'd never, never go back um, and never leave here. Mm. That's that's amazing to hear. Um, So the reason why you ended up here was because of a dog and a pin. (laughs) Yeah, when you you think about it like that, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how this journey of life meanders and we end up in unexpected places. Yeah. How did your families react to that? Not particularly well. Mm. Um, my husband's family reacted probably a lot better. Yeah. Um, my family don't 
like the idea of people doing well. And mm. so um, I probably, I was cut off quite quickly because wow. I'd broken the apron strings and, and gone off to um, find something just, good for myself mm -hmm. and for my family. So, um, yeah, it didn't go down particularly well. You would think that family would be happy to see people spread their wings and fly and go and explore and have experiences and try to make dreams come true. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, you're your own person, aren't you? And you have to do what feels right for you. You know, I'm not... Um, I don't agree with some of the things or some of the decisions that my daughter's made um, mm -hmm. for herself, but she is happy with those decisions. And so I have to support that. And, and if they work, great. If they don't work, then you're mm -hmm. there as a parent to support them in making a change and, and a change of direction to make it work. Um, but yeah, it's all about just letting people decide for themselves and, and going out and finding their own way and what works for them. Because if everything was the same and every um, everything was prescriptive, Mm -hmm. and you followed a prescription of life, it would be pretty boring, wouldn't it? It would. There would be not much point for anything. I love the fact that I'm going to have a meeting, it's planned, but I have no idea what people are going to say in the meeting. And yeah. I think that's one of the sparks of life. There's a lot of information available about people on the internet, and I did my research, and I checked out LinkedIn, where... All good information about business can be found. And I was looking through your work experience. Something stood out, which I thought was quite fascinating. It reads, Executive Personal Assistant to the Right Honourable Earl and Countess of Seafield. And when you were describing your work history, I didn't hear you mention that. So where does that? fit into the whole picture so uh that fits into the picture because that was the oh i'm just going to take this job this admin position to get me working in scotland whilst we find our feet find a house and i find the job that i really want to do mm -hmm. this will do for one year and mm -hmm. then i'll be moving on and as you saw from my LinkedIn profile, it lasted <laughs> almost three years. Yeah. Um, yeah, and what an experience. So this job, um, when we had decided to move to Scotland and um, everything was going with us lock, stock and barrel, minus my daughter, by the way, who stayed, um, who stayed in the Midlands and still is there, I put the feelers out for people that I knew and um, connections that we'd made up here to keep a lookout for a job for me. Mm -hmm. And up came an admin assistant's job, um, which came with a house. Um, wow. And it was for the chief executive of Seafield Estates. That'll do. I'll do that. I can do that standing on my head. <laughs> um, yeah. So off went my CV. And the, the puzzled reply came back of, you're so far away. Um, and after I'd explained that I was planning on moving, I came for an interview, flew up, came for an interview, was offered the job, but then told that the job that I'd accepted wasn't strictly for the chief exec of Seafield Estates and that it was mm. actually as a personal assistant to um, Lord and Lady Seafield. Wow. That's pretty interesting because once again, the plan changes. Yep. Yep. And maybe, here's my theory, because they'd met you and spoken to you, they'd realized that there was something else you could do, something different you could do to help them. It's quite fascinating. So what were the types of tasks you had to do within that framework there? So as an executive personal assistant, as you can imagine, there was a lot of organizing and um, looking after the house, the staff within it, making sure that travel plans are in place and mm. um, taking care of personal shopping, making mm -hmm. sure that Christmas was organized. I used to organize the shoots um, and 
make sure that their London business was taken care of and that their house in London was taken care of. What I hadn't thought, even thought about before I took the job was that my very first job every single morning was to make sure that Lord Seafield's pencils were sharp. <laughs> that's, that's not funny. I shouldn't laugh. Um, everybody's got their little nuance or tick or I don't know how people would describe it. The thing that they like yeah. that makes a difference to their day, whether it's me with putting a bit of cream in my coffee or somebody else might just like to take a walk for five or ten minutes. Yeah. But um, his pencils needed to be sharp. Yeah, I think I'd like to think that I transformed their life a little bit and dragged them into the new millennium, really. Um, when I first started there, the previous secretary had been with them for a great number of years, 25 years. Wow. And um, when I arrived, they were still underlining printed documents with red pen. So I introduced them to a colour printer. And somebody needed to do that. Yeah. It was it was a revelation to them. They thought I was wonderful that I I I was this inventor that had come up <laughs> with these huge decisions um, and pretty mm. much cut the workload down by half. Yeah, I can I can imagine. I, I hope you also taught them to copy and paste. Or... Well, that was my job. Ah, okay, right. That's why you were there. <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> no more sticky dots. Mm. It was always a, a red bullet. Mm. What do you think causes people to get stuck behind in that world? Comfort, I guess. Mm, and sense. people being comfortable and and fear of moving on to a, a, a new system or looking at a, a new way of doing things. Um, and I, I, I suppose that's sort of been my life really is that I, I like challenges, absolutely love challenges. I love thriving and, and doing well and I like achieving. So I guess that's why I haven't stuck in a certain position, particularly mm -hmm. in my career, because yeah. I've always been looking for the next thing, the next challenge, the next thing that's going mm -hmm. to make me think, oh, can I do this? Um, but actually, um, as I was told from a very early age, and it's something, if you look on my personal page on my Facebook, mm -hmm. is um, I was told at a very early age that there's no such word as can't. Right. How does that work when your family didn't support you? I just found my own way. Okay. There's no such word as can't. And but, so but did that come from your family? That came from a grandfather. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so it maybe sort of skipped a generation. <laughs> yeah, it, I don't know how that happened. And, um, you know, I, I probably put it down to I'm very, very close to my grandparents. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather's no longer with us, sadly, but... Um, I spent every weekend, every school holiday with them. And so I was, I had a very, very close bond with them, whereas my siblings didn't. And so I took on their values right. and their purpose and, yeah, lived more of their life than I did my parents. Oh, well, that makes perfect sense. It's also very interesting as well that we can be so strongly influenced by people who are within our environment but not directly yes absolutely so. and and I think my parents my mother in particular is has a very negative outlook on on things and I guess before I moved here I also had that negativity about me mm -hmm. and although I believed that there was nothing really that I couldn't have a go at. I'm not saying that everything I've achieved or done well, but I'll have a go at it. But when you're faced and you have that little element of negativity within you also, mm -hmm. it makes life difficult. Yep. And so you then start looking for people to blame for why not. Yep. And so when you take that negativity out of your life cycle and you you know, you've been cut off from that, rightly or wrongly, or through no fault of your own, 
that negativity starts to diminish. And mm -hmm. that was one thing that I was hell bent on changing about myself is that losing the negativity. And it's taken a long time, but I think over the last few years that's disappeared. And so it's allowed me to think that I can change things and I can do something without the fear of messing it up because at least I've tried it and at least I've challenged myself and I've tried to achieve something. If it's not the right road, then you take a different one and, and you find another challenge. Yeah, and there's always the contradiction of friendships where the people around you like you for who you are. But if you want to become someone different and change, that can make those relationships very complex. Yeah, there's. A, I think friendship is a... It's an odd thing, isn't it? And some people have friends that they've had for life. I've, I've got very good friends that are distance friends and I don't see very often. Mm -hmm. But when we pick up a conversation, it's as if I'd just seen them two or three days ago. Yeah. And and so that my friendship circle isn't a big friendship circle. I could count on one hand how many good friends I have but they are very dear to me. Mm -hmm. um, we all have very different ways, different ways of dealing thing with things, have had different life experiences. But the similarity between us is we have a mutual respect to um, respect each other's opinions yeah. and, and we will challenge each other. Mm -hmm. um, probably some of the greatest friends that I've met recently um was uh, being stuck out in the middle of the Sahara and uh oh wow yeah, yeah I want to hear I, <laughs> I want to hear that story because um I saw on Facebook that you posted like an anniversary of a trip or a journey that you took is, yeah. is, that's that that's the one right yeah that's is, the one yeah. I want to hear about the Sahara okay. how did you end up out there how did that happen so I decided um, that I wanted to raise funds for lupus. And I, I hadn't, I, I, I don't, didn't run at that point. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know what lupus is. It's an autoimmune disease. Okay, right. So um, I had decided that I would wanted to raise funds I wanted to do something good and challenge myself at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I would run 100 miles in the UK right. and trek 100 kilometers through the Sahara. Because that's what people do? Or how did that pop into your head? Where did that come from? Well, I suppose I could have done a sponsored walk, right. um, but... That's not a great challenge. It's, it, you know, it is a challenge to some people, but it, it wasn't yeah. to me. And I wanted to do a whole year of, of this challenge um, and to really to push myself and to raise as much money as I could. Yeah. So I started training and, mm -hmm. and running and um, did several different runs from the Nairn 10K to Port Soy yep. 10K. Yep. I did the Scottish half marathon mm. and then my last um, 26.2 miles of my challenge was wow. to run the London marathon, which I did three years ago. Oh, fantastic. And then came the part of the trek in the hundred kilometers through the Sahara. Mm. So I, I went with a company that do adventure challenges and I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. So off I went, I uh, left Aberdeen Airport, my husband pushing me on. And, he he uh, was like, off, off, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> as long as the fridge is full, that's fine. You go <laughs> and just watch the scorpions. Yeah. And, uh, give, give me a call when you get back. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I met my team, my, my team of nine fellow trekkers. And when I arrived at Gatwick mm -hmm. and we none of us apart from two people that had gone together none of us knew each other right. we knew we didn't know of each other we hadn't linked on facebook or any any other social media beforehand um but instantly because you were out there or sitting at in a pub in gatwick airport 
as a group and you were all wanting the same out of that experience yeah. instantly you you had a bond with those people mm. and it's a good job that you did because you was you know nine days with people that you don't know but you're going to sleep very closely to yep. um yeah so how does that work do, do you have like a guide and where do you sleep and do you have to carry a lot of water and you know i don't I'm obviously very ignorant about this. So how does it work? So there was the you had a guide, and yeah. uh, we had three camels, um, and <laughs> I, for, um, I forgot about the camels. A camel yeah. herdsman. I'm not sure what you call them. <laughs> um, That's but good. It's good for they, me. They they carried um, most of our stuff for us, and we obviously you had to travel light, um, mm. which is as a woman is quite strange feeling Ooh. that you're not taking the kitchen sink with you and um <laughs> that must be difficult packing yeah it was it was quite difficult and uh, there was lots of youtube videos watched on how to pack your <laughs> uh, how to pack your underwear in the smallest do, way possible do, do you have to roll them and up actually or? yeah so yeah. um each day i had a pack which was packed into a freezer bag type mm. bag and um, labeled up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay, is that like one of the, um, one of those bags that keeps all the air outside? And so, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. that type of thing. So um, that managed to pack things, and actually that's seen me very well over the last few years because now I can travel quite lightly yeah. rather than trying to take everything. And you realise that actually you don't need everything. So that was my packing. So no, you just um, you have a day pack which you have to carry which was yep. pretty heavy um with all of the water that you need food at lunchtime is provided which was quite nice yeah. so um y your guide you go on to the next stop where yeah. they'll they'll provide food for you and at the stops do you get fresh water or do you have to how does that work you do get fresh water but you do have to be quite careful with it mm -hmm. um obviously you're in the sahara and um, there's wells that they can take water up from mm -hmm. um but for them to go to you know they can't just pop to the shop and, and buy water so it does make you mm -hmm. um very quickly you do have to start thinking about how you're going to conserve water so mm -hmm. washing and you know keeping your hair clean is out of the window it's yeah. it's not needed as such it also makes you appreciate how lucky we are absolutely in the, in the modern world that oh i turn on my tab i get hot water instantly yes yeah and as a treat halfway through the trek they did actually set up a, a shower tent for us wow. um for those who wanted to use it however i didn't you didn't. I just soldiered on. Why, why didn't you use it? I didn't feel a need to. Okay. You're already four days in and pretty sweaty and mucky. I was just going to get that way again. So that's um, a good point. Let's you're you're going to get a bit of water. And <laughs> um, however, I was definitely the first in the shower when we got back to the hotel. Yeah, I can imagine. Wow. What was your takeaway from that experience? What what was the biggest piece of learning there? I think more reflection. Mm -hmm. I I learned to to reflect a lot, um, and and I did do a lot of reflection while I was there. You know, de there was days where you could be trekking and talking away to your fellow trekkers, but there was also days where you you were just quite happy to walk along and, and just be lost in your own thoughts and there was a lot of um soul searching really during that mm. that week that week and a half um, and I think that has pushed me to think a bit more outside of the box and not be so caught up in what other people want or what what other people expect of you but to find your own way and and it's okay to to change direction or um, make a change of decision mm -hmm. because it you have to live with it what was your partner's perspective of that he thinks i'm nuts <laughs> <laughs> he um he's very supportive and he knows that if i set my mind to something and i want to do it then 
I will do it. And mm-hmm. and although, you know, you you do you're you're in a relationship and you have to consider the other person, yeah. he knows that um that it is important to me to be able to challenge myself. And sometimes he doesn't like it or worries for me, mm-hmm. um, but he will always support me. Um when I told him I was going to run an ultra marathon, he um I, I don't think I can say what his um, reaction was because I don't think I can swear. Um, but throughout the whole of the training for the 26 weeks of training, wow. every long run, he came with me on his bike and wow. would, um, you know, we were up hills and mountains and um, through forests and, and he would train with me um, because he knows how important it is. Wow, fantastic. And when did you do the ultra marathon? So the ultra marathon I did um, two years ago, mm. and um, I have another ultra marathon this year that I'm just about to start training for. Wow! And this was all born from this um, challenge that I did three years ago because I was never going to run again after London Marathon. Mm. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> How long is an ultra marathon? Well, it can go um, up to 60, 70, 80 miles. Um, but I do the baby ones, so I do 37 miles. That's not saying that I won't do longer ones mm-hmm. in future. Um, yeah. But um, at the moment, I'm happy at doing. I, like, I don't, it's not so much the distance, it's the surroundings. So two years ago, I did Speyside Ultra Marathon. Mm-hmm. And um, as you've worked out I love this area I love Speyside so the idea of being able to run from Cragamore through to Bucky yeah. um, over Ben Agan yeah. is just it, it's a no-brainer for me really so um, off on, I went on a nice day on it, it wasn't a nice day <laughs> um, it, it was an awful day the weather was not so great um, but that didn't seem to matter. I suppose it's a little bit like childbirth. You've forgotten about it when you cross the line, and uh, and you've got the pleasure of, <laughs> and you've got the pleasure of having something hanging yeah. around your neck. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. So my next ultra marathon is Tyree, yeah. and again, that's a it's a, a beautiful island. Um, so yeah, the 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 place is more important to yeah. me. It's a great way to observe things mm-hmm. if you have the time to do that while you're uh, yeah. while you're moving along or jogging along what are the secrets to preparing for that are there any do you just like start running a certain distance and then increase it step by step gradually or is, is yeah there so else? i follow a plan right um it's it i follow it very loosely because i think if you follow a plan too rigidly you start to get panicky that you may not be able to follow it verbatim. And so for me, the whole experience of training for an ultra marathon matters and I have to enjoy the whole of it. And and actually the training is the bit that I enjoy the most. And so um, if you're then getting yourself wound up that you're not able to do a run on Tuesday because Mm -hmm. you've got to, do something to do with work yeah. then then that then starts making it not very enjoyable for you mm. and so I'll I'll I know what I need to do yep. um and I know where I need to be at certain weeks so as long as I can be there and and you know make sure that the training is in place then that's yeah. what I'll do but yeah it's all about the training and the preparation and the mindset and the mindset of your body will tell you that you need to give up long, long, long before you actually need to. Uh There's a Navy SEAL philosophy that I once read about, which is when you feel completely destroyed, that's 40%. Yeah. And I know some people who are involved in more extreme physical activities and they have told me that you can always push yourself a little bit further. Yeah, and that's again with, and that's how life has taken me. Really, is that you're in all of the training, going to the Sahara, mm-hmm. moving to Scotland. You know, you 
you do have this capability within you and and when things look really bad and that's it you need to give up and and you just can't do it anymore yeah. there is always that last push yeah. um it's never easy and i think having a supporter behind me pushing me on that is um that's important too you know i'd got to 30 four miles of space eyed ultra yeah. and got to port knocky and thought you know i can't do anymore i i'm done my legs are jelly oh, wow. and the next thing i see is my husband driving up and down the road in his jeep shouting come on you can do it <laughs> get a wriggle on so um you know there's that and and yeah. then that gave me that extra couple of miles to to complete it I wish everybody supported everybody like that. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, the, the world would be such a brighter place. And we'd achieve so much more. Yep, yep. Yeah, just, just shouting for each other, you know? It would make such a big difference. So, in my research, I discovered that you use notebooks. I do, lots of them. And um, I'm curious about where that comes from and how that fits into your philosophy. Uh, you didn't expect that question. No, I didn't. Did the, you? Um, I think because I like to have a plan, a loose plan. I like to write things down. I've got a terrible memory. Mm. And so I do like to write things down and I do like to go back and reference them. But I also, I've tried having electronic notes i've tried kindles i've i've tried all sorts of things like that yeah. but there's just having that pen and paper is um is very important to me um and and being a visual person mm -hmm. i can see what's in front of me i can carry it about with me it's yeah, yeah. important although i never kept a diary when i was younger because i had the intentions of doing it and then got three days in and fell asleep and forgot to write anything down. I think almost everybody has had that experience. I, I'm sure I started a diary about six times at six different Christmases or New Year's and yep. kept it for about a week. And yep. then and then that was it. I'd, I'd love to know where those books are now. Actually, <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. Um, but it's interesting that... You do keep the notes. It's interesting that you know that you've got, you said, a poor memory and that you use the notes to help you with your targets, your aims, your goals, with reflection. Um, do you think it makes a difference? I think it does. And particularly now, I'm going back over notes and looking at things that, you know, when you think, what, what, would, what did I do in that scenario? What did I do? do when I was working for um, Coombe Country Park about this situation and situations never really change it just mm. technology gets better doesn't it mm. um, but I, I, I was watching a program about Selfridges and how that um, how Selfridges be was one of the first department stores yeah. and how Mr Selfridge um, what his values were and what he believed in and how it made him so um so rich really and right. and so his principles on customer service and the way that we deal with customers and give our customers the experience that they need to be able to get them to spend money with us are exactly what I put across in the workshops that I um that I teach because mm -hmm. it's amazing that this sort of couple of hundred year old principle still comes through now um he was all about giving the customers the experience when they came to his store and really valuing women um, because he knew that they were the ones that really held the purse strings. Mm. And, you know, who would have thought now that it's exactly what we do now, but we do it through technology, through yep. social media. Oh, absolutely. Um, the wife very often is planning the budget at home, is organizing the family and she does control the purse strings a lot of the time in the same way that children 
influence their parents yeah. to spend their money. And so a lot of advertisers will try one way or another to market towards children. I know that you've also done some work with young people in workshops as well. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. That um, was part of Career Ready, uh, which is run within Murray. And um, I ran a workshop on Brand You. So all about how young people are put themselves across to um, potential employers. Mm -hmm. So um, all about their brand, what their values are, what their purpose is is and and what they believe in and so carrying that through into the workplace and carrying it through when when they're going to interview or how they put that across to employers to make sure that firstly the employer is happy to that they're going to fulfill the job that they're going into and going, mm -hmm. to, going to be happy within it but also themselves that the employer is going to be able to um, provide they're going to be able to scratch that itch. You know, it's it's pointless going into a role that doesn't fit your values. Yeah, Absolutely. It, it makes perfect sense. And I think young people forget that they themselves are a brand. They forget that they have to sell themselves. And it's one of the missing keys of education that when people do leave the system, they don't have that system of support anymore. They've got to make all these important decisions by themselves. And the only way to do it is to sell yourself. What I've told a lot of my younger clients in the past is I, I use a very strong analogy. I say, we're all prostitutes. Yeah. <laughs> We all, in one way or another, have to sell the skills and abilities that we have to get forward in life, to be successful. That's it. And be, but being true to yourself as well and, and selling those values that you personally have and not what somebody else tells you that you've got. Yeah. Um, I, When I spoke to the pupils, I'd put across that, you know, I it would have been great if when I was at school and, and, and I'd it would just have been wonderful to have had that opportunity for two years to really look at what I wanted to do and what type of person I was and what my values, vision and purpose was because mm -hmm. I left school having sat probably a 20 minute interview with a careers officer yeah. um, and I think I, I can't even remember what she said that I could be probably a zookeeper or something. <laughs> So when I when I was preparing for the session that I was delivering, I went through the same process that the pupils mm -hmm. were going to go through. Now I've I've done a lot of um, sort of vision finding and uh, different adult ways of being able to yeah. to find my brand, and and it's never really quite stuck with me. Mm -hmm. So having done this with sixteen year olds. And gone through the process and how um, how they were going to do it. Actually, I had a light bulb moment, and when I was thinking back to jobs that I'd had previously, mm -hmm. and why either I hadn't enjoyed them or I hadn't stayed there. Yeah. So when I look at the job that I've had for the longest and held for the longest, which um, in total would have been um, Coombe Country Park, yeah. very much aligns with my values mm -hmm. and my purpose because it was all about people and giving something back and caring for something and caring for and, and providing a service and a and a solution to somebody's problem being outdoors being with nature and being interested in cultural heritage and where we've come from and how landscapes affect what happens to us now yeah. so all of the other jobs that I've done meantime so personal assistant general manager retail director there's always been something that hasn't sat well with me and although it's great to do the job and be a manager and have the power it's taught me a lot about business it's never really scratched that itch yeah 
and never sat well with my own values Mm -hmm. um, or my own purpose. It's very important to recognize that because people who don't recognize that are going to be a little bit lost in what they're trying to do. And I imagine that's something that you can bring into your work with clients as well, this ability to recognize needs. It's also really interesting that you said earlier your grandfather influenced you and that you like heritage. Yeah. There's a, there's a very, I think, strong connection between those things. And I also liked what you said about the kids, that it's important to understand that you are not what people tell you you are. Yes, definitely. That you can become within certain limitations, almost anything you want to be if you put in the work and the effort that is required there. It's a great message. You must need a lot of energy and inspiration to do the work you do. Where does that come from? My energy and my will comes from within, really, and just the absolute want to achieve and to be able to challenge myself there's a lot of support there in the background and subconsciously my husband really does push me on and um, he makes sure that I follow through on whatever I've decided to (laughs) challenge myself on he's your accountability Uh, my inspiration there's there's lots of people that inspire me and it, it very much depends on what I'm doing or, or or what I'm up to but um I think my main I keep going back to my grandfather my main inspiration is him you know he's he's very my grandparents are very working class he was a painter and decorator for the council mm-hmm. they would by far the you know they they didn't have money they they weren't very wealthy but they're always very happy i don't think i ever saw a time where um there was any unhappiness within their household and i was pleased to be a part of that but they gave back such a lot so they um, my grandmother was a brown owl um and they were um they lived on a council estate. Sorry, your grandmother was... <laughs> she was a brown owl. I have no idea what <laughs> so that is. So the brownies, um, oh, so there's oh guides right. and brownies and rainbows. Yeah, okay. So she was a brown owl. So she um, had a pack of brownies, but they were... So does, is that a leader of a group yes. of young girls. girls who like adventurous activities or yeah. something like yeah, that? Yeah, that's it. Right, got it. But it was a family affair, really, because my grandfather was also involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and and my auntie was was Snowy Owl, so <laughs> she <laughs> she was part of this pack as well. But it was a group that was, uh, you know, there's lots of so there's hundreds and hundreds of brownie packs throughout the world, and they all do their special thing. But my grandparents would take um, a pack of young girls every year from as I said they're they're on a council estate nobody had a great deal of money Mm -hmm. um it was a um you know a coal mining community anyway and um so it might have been the only holiday that these children were getting so we went to Cromer every year and help help me where is in Norfolk right okay and um we would spend the week where my grandparents along with their helpers basically gave a holiday and it was amazing just the best experience I went from the age of five all the way through until they kicked me out really until my grandparents retired so I would go back as a helper and I took my daughter um, and and we just had the best of fun we'd play cricket down on the beach we would Mm go on my grandfather would call it a midnight walk but it wasn't it was about nine o'clock at night and right. you know just just having those adventures that uh, that kids need to have um and camping in a church hall what could be better wow all of the activities that are in some way available to people in and around this area mm-hmm. that's very interesting yeah as well What's your limit? I don't think I have one. Okay. 
I, very much the same as I don't have a filter. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure rightly or wrongly that I know my limits. Mm -hmm. I think I question my limits, right. um, but I always have to dip my toe in and just see if I was right or wrong. Um, I don't think I have one. I wish I didn't have any limits. <laughs> I think I could. I think I could do a lot more. Right. What's the most important thing for you work-wise right now? What's your focus on? My focus at the moment is making sure that or or exploring exactly what I am doing. Again, this is a very organic process and I am currently I'm jumping from one idea to another because I'm trying to find my balance with it. And it, it may be that, you know, space side management is something that I do not as a full-time job. It's something okay. that I do um, ad hoc. And in my days off, it might be that I need to, I get another itch that I have to scratch mm -hmm. and so have to do something else um, instead. Um, but who knows? It's, it's, all a, it's all a learning game, isn't it? It is. What are the most important things that you've recognized that organizations need when you meet people and when you talk to them? What are the things that pop out or stand out as missing? Blinkers. I think it's very easy to, when you're involved in a business so heavily, that you have, that you wear blinkers and you can't or won't see outside of the box. And I know that's kind of a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a rubbish saying is to think outside of the box. But I think there's a real need for that to bring in fresh eyes and to look at it from a different perspective. Because they, you know, you, there, there's, there's things that you could be missing and new ideas that come along or new experiences that somebody else has had. Um, one of the things that I think business owners um, could do or, and big business owners is learn a lot from their staff, but mm -hmm. give a lot back. Right. So take their experiences and act upon them because they've got a wealth of information just from their staff if they just listen to them. Yeah. Well, that's the core of the organization. That's the mechanics of the organization. If there's one part of the machine that is not working, then the whole machine is broken in essence. Yep. So taking care of each individual part makes me think of a watch, for example. And obviously not a digital watch, but the same principles, I guess, with a digital watch as well. That If one part is not working, then the whole thing doesn't function. That's right. So you've got to take care of all of those elements within. I want to be really respectful of your time this morning. And thank you very much for sharing a wealth of interesting stories from your background. I am I'm, I'm still in awe <laughs> of a lot of things that you have told me. If people are interested in learning more about Speyside Management or getting in touch with you, how do they find you? They can go onto my website, which is spacesidemanagement.co.uk or I have a Facebook page, Speyside Management, or I'm on LinkedIn, Samantha Dowdle. Mm -hmm. What's the best way? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Samantha Dowdle. Yes, super. So once again, Thank you. I wish you great success with your business and other ventures in the future. And I really hope that we get to continue this conversation at some point in time. Thank you. You're very welcome. Made in Mari is a product of the Academy of Language Therapy and Life Coaching. Book a free online personal or professional development consultation today. What are you waiting for?